It's uh, eight oh one, and we're going to kick off our webinar this morning called Bullets Fly. Uh, this week's been a, a week of great anxiety for South African investors, as the biggest share on the market at one stage was off twenty percent or more, and this was led by a Chinese regulatory uh, crackdown in, uh, in in China, which impacted Ten Cent and by consequence Naspers. Today, we're honored to have with us Lillian Li. Um, she's been a, a well-respected author and analyst of the Chinese tech sector for some time, and has recently gained some prominence and been quoted all over the financial papers regarding how to view the Chinese crackdown. Um, Henry, one of our analysts, was reading through um, one of Lillian's articles and thought she's, you know, it sounded like she was just the right person to educate us and, and give us some perspectives. So Lillian is beaming through from Shanghai. We've made it a small world. We'd like to thank you very much for um, coming to, to, to chat, to, chat to us at uh, very short notice. So before we start, I just wanted to share one or two slides. Um, I think this is really the nub of what's happened. This is the 10 cent share price. Um, so you can see it got to a high of about 750 Hong Kong dollars back in January, and it subsequently bounced down to 450, which is 40% down. So we would ca categorize that as a crash in the share price, although one should bear in mind uh, that the share did go through a big rise and is basically back to around the, share, the same price that it was a year ago. But remembering that the pandemic has certainly accelerated the digital futures of many of our companies. So how has that flowed through to NASPAS? Given the dominance of Tencent in Naspass's life and valuation, um, Naspass has, has shown a similar pattern, um, up to a high of close to 4,000, and at one stage down, uh, down to 2,500. And now bouncing about, as many of you who watch the stock market, you would have seen it drop 20% during the course of this week, and then back up about 15%. Just to remind people, uh, the NASPAS and process stable, uh, our, cal our calculation of the value of the underlying business, 10 cent comprises 81% of it. So in effect, 20% uh, of the South African stock market is exposed to NASPAS, and that's predominantly 10 cent, and hence the importance of this. Other unlisted investments in cash, 14, and other listed stakes, five. If we then look at uh, where we sit from a discount perspective, so if we take the full value of NASPAS uh, on our market, we think it's trading at about a 50% discount. And in process, which is listed in Europe and in South Africa, about a 35% discount. So also on this call, and we'll move over to that once, uh, once we finished with Lillian, uh, Mike Gresty, who's a senior fund manager and analyst at, uh, at Anchor, who's covered NASPAS for many, many years is going to be talking through the flow through from Tencent into Process and NASPAS. And important, importantly, over the course of the next two weeks, um, shareholders are going to be asked whether they'd like to switch some of their NASPAS shares into Process. And Mike's going to give some views on that. So that is the background to the conversation. Um, but really, this is all about hearing from Lillian. So the Lillian, welcome. Um, perhaps if I can start off with... Uh, a question leading you into the key parts of the article that you put out recently. I'm sorry, be, before I say that, um, we, we, we found Lillian through her Twitter account and a subscription service she's got called CN Characteristics. So for people who are interested in following this, um, she's a great resource to follow. Um, you can go and search for that on the net or Lillian, you, I'm very happy for you to start off telling us how to do that. Uh, but we found <laughs> Let's yes. start off. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Lillian, perhaps just to start off and, and lead you into it, how would you characterize the Chinese tech sector in its current form? Um, you've got the, the dominance of, of big tech companies. They're almost like de facto institutions. And, um, you know, perhaps put that in context of, of what's happening right now. Yes. Um, so, you know, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, you know, talk about what's been happening recently and hopefully be, be helpful for folks. So to address the question, um, I 
have a background first in economics and then in development economics. And one of the things, you know, I spent a lot of time, my time in my youth studying was notions of institutions and the de facto definition of institutions as defined by Douglas North is it's, you know, I'm quoting him here, the rules of the game in a society or more formally, the humanely devised constraints that shape human interactions. And, you know, as I kind of left the sphere of development economics and went over to the dark side of uh, venture tech investing for the past um, six or something years I've been in that, it gradually dawned on me that tech institutions, the uh, tech rather, tech companies, have taken on more and more the shapes of what we would consider traditional institutions, as in, you know, these are organizations that now dictate the rules of the game in a society. So, uh, just to pick up some non Chinese specific examples, as I'm sure most people think, uh, essentially sets the moderation policy for about one third of the world by saying what can or can't be published on their platform. And because so many people on their platform, what they say becomes law. And then, you know, with the recent deplatforming of Trump by Twitter and other tech players, they've essentially reduced one of the most powerful individuals in the world to, you know, a nobody overnight. And this is a very big stark contrast in terms of how we would maybe term these tech companies as, you know, we support monopolies or utilities. So when we think about utilities, that might be telephone rails, but a traditional telephone rail can't tell you who you can talk to or what you can say. But that is within the sphere of influence for these large tech organizations globally. And that's kind of firm that I adopt for general tech institutions and you know we can go into why because there's properties for them where they have increasing marginal returns um, to scale rather than uh, but more importantly i think in the case of china what we're seeing is actually a very interesting new case because china in in not at least my mind, but at least as, as they see themselves and as we can see in the world, they are actually a developing country. And for a developing country, one of the key things is that their governance and institutional structures is weak. So for tech players who have arisen in China, they've not just become de facto institutions, but they've actually, you know, these private players actually have taken on a lot of properties that you'd expect public institutions to have. And let me give you some examples in China specifically. So firstly, you have um, Ant Financials or Ant Group, as they're now rebranded to. They started off as you know, a subset of Alibaba in the early 2000s. And they started back in a time when China didn't have credit cards and there was no payment rails. And so they actually um, collaborated with some uh, microsystems at the time to build out the entire bank, uh, banking rails and settlement structure for China. And that is a private company doing something that theoretically should be more in the public sphere. And you see this time and time again with tech companies in China. You know, they've kind of grown up in um, an environment where public institutions are inadequate to address um, many issues of governance. And so they have, you know, formed almost symbiotic relationship with the old institutions um, as they become kind of these, what I would term like new digital institutions in China. So, but DD has... Um, they're not just a taxi company, but what they really did was that they cleaned up this really huge gray market for black cabs in China during the early 2000s, which was also a big issue because there was kind of lots of um, improper going ons, lots of, um, you know, uh, potential robberies and violence happening in these cabs. And, you know, one of the reasons why they were so supported by the government was because they were able to introduce this kind of le legibility into governance on the part, part of the government in a more efficient way than traditional government institutions have been able to do in China. And I think we can sort of literally go through every single big player um, in China and then sort of see how they've done this um, or, you know, some part of governance function on behalf of the government. You know, Tencent in particular, as we're talking, they've been essentially one of the biggest content moderators, right, on behalf of the party. You, um, there are some words that are just blocked on, on WeChat as soon as uh, they're out because it's too sensitive. And, you know, at this point, all of these tech institutions are very, very ingrained within the day-to-day -day lives of the Chinese people um, that in some ways, 
I think you really need to understand how powerful they are as institutions um, because they've been able to grow up and grow up in this kind of space. And so why this, um, you know, I said this framing is just really to emphasize the scope of power that these organizations, institutions have, and therefore the scope of power then, you know, leads on us to sort of form why there's been, you know, quote unquote, a regulatory backlash, which in my mind has been more of a rebalancing in the sphere of um, consumer rights versus these platforms. Thanks, Lillian. So, I mean, you, you, in your article, you make reference to anti-competitive practices and the likes of Alibaba, Tencent, JD have obviously got very, very big. And you were saying if they were in the West, they would almost be uh, open and shut kind of anti-competitive cases. Is that a fair assessment? Um, I definitely think for a lot of cases it would be. I mean, I'll, I'll take a very basic example, which is still um, shocking to me, but you can't easily post Talba, uh, Alibaba Talba links, which is you know Alibaba's biggest B2C platform. You can't easily post those links in Tencent. Um, you know, they've kind of blocked each other and Tencent will make a case to block any um, subsidiaries or investee companies of Alibaba. And they also block ByteDance. So all of these kind of TikTok slash Dorian links, they're also blocked in Tencent. Tencent's official reason for blocking these links is, you know, they're spam, but they will allow their investee companies, so the likes of Pinduoduo and Kuaishou, they will allow very similar companies to then, you know, allow their links on the platform. So these very basic things to me feels... Um, you know, like this just wouldn't exist if we're talking about the likes of Facebook or Google, but they do exist in China. They have been existing for a very long time. And then other practices, including Alibaba and Meituan's practice of going to a merchant and making them pick one out of uh, two platforms. So in Alibaba's case, they have competitors in JD.com or Pindodo, and they will go to a merchant and say, hey, you know, you can't be on all of these platforms. You can only pick one. You can only, if you're on our platforms, then you have to for forfeit all the platforms, which again, feels like a very anti-competitive um, case to me that is almost like a no-brainer in the West. I think the one where you do get into a bit of a nuanced discussion is maybe what's been happening recently with DD and the national security concerns around that. And that's a bit more complicated. So, you know, to your point, I, I don't think it's all open and shut cases, but for a lot of these, I think there's huge Western pre precedents on how they, the exact same things has been treated in the West. And, you know, I think in most cases, they wouldn't even have risen in the West um, for, for these practices. So Lillian, maybe to go off track of, of the path that we're on just quickly. Um, so you've got these companies with big kind of walled gardens. If they're forced to open up, who's the winner, who the winners and who the losers from this perspective? Yeah, so I would say um, in terms of, let, let's, let's talk about kind of like the, uh, the top tier players for Alibaba and Tencent. I would say opening up Ward Gardens to me initially would be, you know, winners would be maybe Alibaba with additional access, easy traffic to from Tencent. Um, it's not clear to me whether Tencent does lose enormously because you know you, you don't conduct commerce on Tencent. Tencent is very much kind of the aggregator of traffic. So actually for me, the more obvious losers might be Pinduoduo and Kuaishou, these um, other kind of e-commerce e or short video platforms that take a lot of traffic from Tencent. Um, and then I think Douyin or TikTok, you know, as, as it's known in the West is another obvious winner because they've been blocked in the past. So having um, uh, been able to tackle this massive pool of close garden traffic um, is also a clear winner. I think with, um, with, with Tencent, the question really is, you know, how, um, how much the linking will be purely down to, uh, you know, how, how much, how much rights they could have over the, the potential linking, because there is another case of saying if they don't, um, because there is some credits to the fact that they do stop certain spamming messages on platform. So if it was completely widely open and the experience does become worse for the user, then they could be a loser here potentially as well. So it's very uncertain, but I, I don't really see, you know, there to be very big changes uh, for Tencent in particular in the short or medium term. Thanks, 
Billion, we, in, in, down in South Africa, we've got terrified over the course of the last week or two. Um, there's Bloomberg news headlines that come through. Um, you know, we're very familiar with a country like America with how rules are made, who makes them. Um, there's generally some reassurance from the government as to what they're doing and why. Um, we, we don't have that. We, have, uh, we don't have that same comfort um, with the Chinese government because of a lack of familiarity. Can you just clarify for us uh, who are the regulatory bodies? How does it work? Um, you know, and then maybe leading through into why they're acting so decisively now, um, you know, and, and, what, and what the catalyst is for what's happened. Yes. Um, so I think maybe just taking a, a big step back and sort of say that the good news is that there is very similar agencies in China that oversees, you know, areas of uh, data regulation or anti-monopoly anti um, but they don't get much airtime. So, so they do exist, but perhaps as if, if you've been reading the Western news, it's not as obvious. And all you hear is just one singular group of regulators or the government or the party. And the bad news is that um, even though there are these different agencies, their remit is somewhat fuzzy and they're overlapping. So it's hard sometimes, and, and you know, maybe that is just the case with the brave new world that we live in that is digital. It's hard to say whether this is cleanly in the remit of one agency or the other. Sometimes they do you know, have overlapping, um, uh, overlapping territories, uh, but I think there's a lot of behind the door discussions and coordinations between agencies on this front. Um, and I think the last point to be made is a lot of these agencies are still relatively new looking at the changes now. Um, you know, a lot of big changes actually happened in 2018. So that's one of the many reasons we're seeing a lot more commotion in the recent years is because a, a lot of these agencies were previously maybe scattered um, in different parts before being centralized or, you know, reorganized in 2014, 2018 and given new remits. So, that's also leading to some of the new changes that we've seen. But I'll just briefly cover kind of the, the, the maybe the four big ones that's um, been in the news directly with respect to different tech companies. And then we can delve into them if people um, have, have the desire to. So the first one is the cyber, a Cyberspace Administration of China, or, you know, as it's short and fun, it's CAC who polices content privacy and cybersecurity. And their incarnation um, really solidified in April 2014. And their general remit is issuing and administering the licenses pro for providing internet news information uh, and licenses for foreign institutions. But uh, typically now the remit has expanded a little more in recent years, especially as they're introducing new legislations into um, doing a comprehensive cybersecurity review of, people, of companies with more than one million users who wants to be listed overseas. Um, so they're generally more within the data sphere and they are also going to be in charge of um, I think implementation and making sure that there is adherence to the new security law that's also coming out in China uh, later this year. And the other um, agency is called the State Administration for Market Regulations, or as it's shortened form, is SAMR. And that's probably been the big one in terms of regulating anti-monopoly practices with Alibaba, with Meituan. So in terms of airtime, uh, SAMR is, is usually one getting about kind of, I would say 80% of them in the past nine months. And so their remit, um, as I mentioned, is more market practices, competitive practices, and they were formed properly in 2018 and included many previous agencies that has also you know, to do with food security and stuff. So when you actually look at their remit, it's, it's actually quite scattered. So they'll be in charge of, you know, anti-monopoly, but, but also food security. So uh, this is quite, it's quite an interesting agency, um, but they also have renewed remit to really focus on anti-monopoly campaigns and have also um, implemented new laws that widens the definition of what is anti-monopoly in 2019 um, as well. So again, that's kind of more firepower in terms of legis legislative practices for them to go after these uh, you know, players, be it tech or non-tech, that has exhibited you know, market distortion practices. And, um, you know, the in terms of finance and what we have heard for Ant Group, that is led 
by People's Bank of China or PBOC, um, which is China's central bank. But they've also been working in consortium with other key organizations also in financial regulations, though they don't get as much airtime. Um, but they've been very much the core regulators to do with the um, IPO pool of Ant Group. And they've been involved with you know, trying to uh, reorganize Ant Group into different, um, well, I'm not sure whether you call it departments or subsidiaries that is more in line with controlling for systemic risk in, um, in, in financial uh, systems. And then I think the one, the last one to sort of keep our eyes on is the Ministry of Information, um, sorry, the Ministry of Ind Industry and Information Technology, so MIIT, um, also one of the government's top reg regulatory bodies um, that regulates the tech industry, who recently began a six-month campaign that, um, that directly involves Tencent. And its remit is to try to sort of clean up, as, as, we, as they kind of put it, you know, threatening data security issues, unauthorized um, internet connections, and then potentially uh, misleading or deceptive practices for the consumer, as well as not being able to uh, link apps across platforms. So I think those are probably the four big ones that people um, ought to sort of keep in, keep in mind. Okay, great. So we've got all of that. Um, it appears from the outside that these agencies have almost worked on a coordinated basis, just given the, the rapid succession of surprise announcements and pronouncements and impact on specific companies. I mean, it, it, how should we interpret the, you know, the, 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 the number of issues that have happened and come through over the course of the last little while? Yeah, it's, um, I would say it is, Sometimes it does feel like a lot, and I, I'm not sure whether it's a combination of um, coordination or you know often there's just similar themes as writing uh, with each other. So you know for DD, theoretically um, that issue has been communicated with them quite a, for quite a long time, but um, you know DD went on uh, went and IPO'd in kind of one of the shortest uh, in in listing history and therefore from the perspective of the uh, CAC regulators it wasn't a desire for them to implement at this pace but you know there is a sentiment that due to the actions of, of GD they also had to speed up their counter um, reactions to it and whereas I think one of the more recent sell-offs had to do with um, regulatory regulations of education sectors which um, have very little to do with traditional tech players, but that has also influenced sentiments across the board. So I do think there has been, you know, a general renewed um, focus on regulation this year, so as we can talk about, but, you know, at least from sitting in China, these seems to be semi-disparate spaces that has been clumped into a general sentiment of, you know, the regulators are going crazy, whereas... I feel like if this was the US or you know maybe Europe people would be like, okay, so this agency is doing this for education. This this agency is doing this for you know transport company who might be in there might, might be leaking data on, and these are kind of the internet regulators. But I, I can sort of understand from the outside, it just seems like every every few days there is a new regulator yeah. out for uh, some sort of tech companies and it can feel very disconcerting. You you indicate in your article that um Ultimately, the Chinese government and the regulators are pragmatic. Um, I guess the fear here is, you know, is there more value destruction coming? Uh, not necessarily value destruction from what's happening there in the businesses, but we see it in our share prices, which are a function, I guess, of the fear and the lack of understanding as to what's happening, but probably more importantly, what might come. Um, you know, should we fear more value destruction? Yeah, and... Um I think it was a great question. I think I go back to one of the key tenets for why Chinese regulators do regulate, right? And um, the article I wrote initially was let bullets uh, fly for a while. And that comes from the sentiment of traditionally in regulatory cadence in China. What, what we've seen is because of information asymmetry and also you know, insufficient regulatory capacity, often Chinese regulators will do a wait and see approach. You know, they'll watch the bullets fly for a while, 
They'll see what's happened, what gets resolved, what doesn't get a result. And then they'll step in when they feel like there has been concrete loss in consumer welfare. And that pattern has repeated itself several times in Chinese tech history. So there's been a similar incident in the early 1990s with Chinese mobile providers who were charging consumers extortionate prices to access mobile plans, you know, and then they were, you know, stopping uh, people on different companies' plans to talk easily with each other without charging high fees. So regulators eventually stepped in and then, you know, calmed, uh, calmed that down. A uh, similar thing happened with P2P where that was, you know, incredibly hot during, I think, the 2015s. And then lots of people poured their life savings into it. And then as these P2P providers started going out of business, then government also stepped in to make sure that there were safer provisions. But they, you know, sometimes they've acted too late. And I think that also weighs on the regulators' minds that, you know, they don't often get it right. Often they wait a bit too late. Um, but it does feel like each time they go in, after observation, and then they implement a set of regulations, but they don't destroy the companies, right? You know, to take the examples of one of the most prominent players of uh, the P2P times was this company called Lufax. Now, Lufax ended up pivoting away from P2P and then becoming an enterprise provider. And then they IPO'd last year to, you know, great renown on the NASDAQ. And then we're kind of seeing similar things with Ant Group. Um, as well, you know, they are getting restructured somewhat, but allowed to continue. Um, and so I guess in terms of the question about value destruction and value creation, it's it's a hard one because I feel like from my perspective, we're seeing some value destruction in the short term for more value creation in the long term. And the aim for these regulations is never to kill the companies because, you know, Chinese regulators at the end of the day is very pragmatic and also it's impossible to kill these tech companies. They're so ingrained in people's lives that they're on utilities. But the aim is to get them on a path that is firstly more sustainable for the consumer and more sustainable for the ecosystem. And so in my mind, yes, there will be volatility in the immediate short term, mostly due to uncertainty. But just looking at the historical practices of regulations, there's never been a case where, you know, they've just gone out and completely obliterated business for for, for no good reason. Um, and usually they want to make it work as much as the next person. This is not some sort of power play as has often been portrayed, but I think it comes from a deep um, desire to protect the consumers. And I think that is reflected when you go online or you talk to people um, you know, here in China, everyone's reaction to these regulations, regulations is actually one of um, happiness because as a consumer, you do feel the squeeze from these tech platforms. And even as workers on these tech platforms, you do feel the squeeze. So people are very happy that the government is able to step in and you know, guide these um, platforms towards a more sustainable path. And I think in many ways, it's also good for the platforms because now they are forced to really think about how to innovate on products rather than just trying to, you know, get the low hanging fruits by squeezing consumers for more money when they're using the same service on the platforms as has been happening for the past year or two. Thanks, Lillian. Um, guys, there's, there's uh, six, 700 participants on this. It's great to have a nice audience like this or so people who came in later. We're chatting to Lillian Lee, who's a um, become a, prominent spokesperson, well, not spokesperson, but commentator on the Chinese tech sector. She comes from um, an econo economics background, and we, we organized her to come and uh, share her thoughts with us. Please feel free to post questions. Um, we're going to get into a bit of a Q&A session. I think some of the initial questions coming through, Lillian, all have a, a, a common theme, um, and it's perhaps a level above the tech companies and sectors specifically, um, and that's the VIE structures. So in layman's terms, um, when you own shares in, a, in an American company, which in an ADR, which would then own Tencent or Hong Kong, it's done through a VIE structure, which effectively is different to the way you would own shares in a normal company where you, and perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, wrong Lillian, my layman's version of it is um, you, you own the economics of the business as opposed to the business itself. Um, because that's not the same as 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 um, or quite unique to China, and people are, are there's an inherent discomfort in some quarters, and 
when you see actions being taken by regulators and, and everything we've been talking about, it's heightened anxiety as to whether we should be comfortable with these structures. So perhaps if you can just, we'll come back to the tech thing quickly, but just perhaps give us a perspective of that. And then you obviously got shares listed in Hong Kong and shares listed in America through ADRs. And there's talk of, uh, you've seen some conjecture that the Chinese government would want to shift it all back to China and Hong Kong. You know, so, so as in, 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 in our investor base, we would have people who own shares in NASPAS through into Tencent, which would also be through a VIE structure. And with their offshore capital, largely in American listed ADRs in the likes of Alibaba and Hong Kong. So how, sh you know, the, the, there is more anxiety over those holdings. Um, perhaps just to give your perspective and help us. Sure. Help us understand. Yeah, so, so my perspective uh, here is that I think, um, yes, traditionally VIE has been something in Chinese uh, governance terminology, you know, the government looks at with one eye open, one eye closed, which means they theoretically is you know, not, not done within the structure of, of, of China, but it's a necess necessity. And when we look at kind of the hard facts of how much, you know, for, for them to do away with the VIE structure, they have to have confidence in a few things, which is that there is enough capital to sustain these Chinese businesses. Um, in China, either in Hong Kong or in Shanghai listings. And that is just not the case at the moment. So um, both the uh, A, sorry, the, the A shares and the, and the HS, I'm, I'm using Chinese balance, but, but both the, Ch uh, the Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong Exchange, uh, while, you know, at least Hong Kong Exchange, while, while decent, is, you know, by no means nearly at the same size at all as that of the US. And, you know, to sustain the amount of Chinese tech companies that want to be listed um, and, and uh, to seek international capital, uh, Hong Kong can't sustain that. So to have these structures be removed, I think would be essentially a death sentence for a lot of companies. And I just can't really see it from a very pragmatic view of um, why that would be good in the short to medium term. And I've had, you know, um, firstly assurances from investors uh, and kind of government officials privately, but also I think we can point to something more public, which is that the Chinese Security Regulatory Commission, um, whose main job is to maintain, a, as, as they call it, a transparent, fair and equitable market and trying to strengthen the protection of investors, both small investors, as well as big investors and you know, facilitate the sound development of the capital market. They called an emergency meeting uh, recently, I think maybe, uh, I think it was long, if not yesterday or two days ago, where um, they reassured investors that, you know, firstly, they understand the turbulence that the, sh the share markets has been going through. And in the future, they'll be more mindful of kind of giving people more heads up about policy measures that's coming, but also um, giving assurance that they are very committed to keeping um, Chinese companies to a, to a global investor base and that these um, protections will be honored. So given these motions, I do have faith that the VIE structure will not be easily removed uh, in the short term. And then perhaps the issue of the uh, Chinese ADRs in Hong Kong, just different listing domiciles? Yeah, that probably I wouldn't, that's probably more beyond my pay grade. So I don't want to okay. give okay, sure, uh, sure. your readers some, yeah. The, um, perhaps getting to, to more specifics, I'd be interested to hear what your perspectives are um, regarding Tencent as a business and ultimately we buy it as a share. Um, what do you what do you what do you think of its prospects over the next few years? You know, perhaps to put it in context, um, the consensus view from the brokers and whatnot to you know the, the stuff that we get fed through and the research we do is um, most big tech companies having a slowish growth year as they reinvest into into new areas, um, but thereafter you know being able to sustain earnings growth of 15, 20 percent thereafter for, you know for a few years. And that's the picture we have. I'd be interested to, to hear what your what your, your perspective of Tencent is. Yeah, so my perspective of Tencent um, is that it's a investment company masquerading as a gaming company. Um, you know, so, 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 so break that down a bit. I mean, firstly, Tencent in, in terms of 
it's diverse business is uh, fascinating. You know, it doesn't, it, because people typically like to convert it to Facebook, but actually when you dig into the revenue streams for Tencent, you very quickly realize that advertising is a tiny portion of um, relative to all of the other different revenue streams in terms of games, in terms of payment, uh, in terms of, you know, valid added, added service, as, as well as now they're kind of moving into the B2B space um, as well with, with Tencent Cloud. So they have a very diverse revenue base and the free cash flow they generate from businesses, predominantly gaming, they will uh, take and then invest in promising uh, startups. And, you know, the story is way back when the Tencent management had a retreat where they thought what was Tencent's main competencies. And they said one was kind of traffic and the other was money. And with that combined, they thought they would make kind of one of the best investment houses in China. And then they were completely correct. So in terms of the moat that Tencent has, um, I think first, I mean, the foundation of the moat is just the fact that so many, um, if not all of China is on WeChat or QQ. Um, and the amount of traffic that Tencent generates organically is immense and they can monetize that through games through everything else and then they can also uh, monetize that further through their messy companies so i think that is um, something that can't easily be replaced as we've kind of seen also with facebook you know network effects here is very very powerful um and i think tencent is making very smart moves into realizing that you know for the next 10 years really for china the story will be more on the b2b side on the cloud adoption side. And so they're making good progress then to um, creating Tencent Cloud and really investing into the startup ecosystem there through investment, through the know-how and through their sector expertise of um, you know, selling cloud to game, gaming companies or selling cloud to their investing companies. So um, you know, in terms of how I see Tencent, it's more, and because my background has been you know, more venture capital, I very much kind of see where is the growth coming from and is Tencent well set up for it and does it have a defensible moat? And then on all of that, I think Tencent scores very well, you know, in the mode of kind of this network effect of communication almost never going to go away in uh, in, in in the media, like definitely unless something you know, big happens and never say never, but very hard to see how that could be displaced. And with that moat and with that natural traffic, um, that gives them incredible power to firstly hold on to existing pools of growth but also to tap into new sources of growth via different startups via different verticals um and then that's precisely what they've been doing for you know the past um decade or so and it's hard to see you know them changing that anytime soon so Lelina, a lot of the, the 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 kind of final nail which saw the share prices take real plummets was the rules about the education companies which we haven't talked about specifically. Um, so to, to put it in context and the way we interpret it, it's it's this kind of tutoring and after school type education that got targeted the most. And the Chinese government and regulators appear to be, you know, looking after their citizens and paying attention, you know, the, the, the pressure getting too much in schooling and times and the amount of time that they're spending and trying to get a bit more balance. That's the way we're viewing it. But they've yes. come out of the regulations which uh, from the outside, looked like it basically kills these companies. Uh, is, is that is that what, what what's happened? Um, um, yes, and uh, yes, uh, like um, no, I I would say so. I, these companies, to me, are not completely dead because I think what the regulation specifically says is you know certain types of tu certain types of uh, tutoring or after school activities, but there's also plenty more. Um, that they can do and specifically within um, in my view there's aspects for vocational training there's aspects for kind of more um, you know uh, extracurricular training uh, that doesn't fall within the remit of the regulation so I would say it's not a quote-unquote death sentence for these companies but I doubt they would be ever as lucrative as they were before because you know, as, as you kind of right, rightfully pointed out, to, to me, I think they were really just monetizing the status anxiety of the Chinese middle class. And they were, you know, one of the popular slogans was, um, hey, if, you, if your kids don't come and train with us, we'll just train your kids competitors. 
which yeah. I think is, you know, something quite terrible to say to any parents because um, it sort of tells, gives them this fear of leaving the, the kids behind. And so it has reached this stage where it's um, it's hard to see how they were adding value to these kids' lives. So I think, again, that's where the regulation came in place. But, you know, I, I don't think it will be, um, it will be a like, you know, they'll completely go away. And also because China has put forward strong indicators that it wants to really heighten vocational training. So it is my view that here is another big opportunity that if these education companies can then pivot into, of course, that requires more linkages for the industry. But if they sort of adopt a more German model where at high school, not everyone's path ends up being university, but they think, hey, I can go out and actually learn a skill such as plumbing or working with high-tech machinery, and these education companies can be sort of part of that journey. That would be, um, I think, a way for them to move forward and also kind of in line with what Chinese government is envisioning for its workforce. The question coming through, um, you've got a lot of experience in Western capital markets. What do you think the West is getting most wrong about what we're seeing play out in China at the moment? <laughs> yeah, so it's a very good question, quite quite, quite a lot. So I think I've, I've, I've touched on um, a few of these already because I think from from the West, um, from, from, well, at least from the outside in, I, and, and I understand this as well because I think I was in a very similar position, it all seems like everything comes down to one single entity and that single entity is the Chinese party. And I think the first point is to realize um, that the Chinese party is not a monolith, that regulators are not a monolith. And, you know, the way to really think about China is what Kenneth uh, Lieberthal determines, you know, fragmented authoritarianism, which means that there's actually many fractions within the Chinese governance systems all competing for power. Not unsimilar, right, to what you see in most big corporates. You know, I'd be very surprised if you told me there was absolutely no politics within you know, any big corporates. So just like in any big organizations, so you're going to have competing fractions who are kind of trying to win out their interest. And it's not a simple, you know, the top says something and it gets carried down as well. And I think maybe that's another misconception is kind of, you know, Xi Jinping says jump and then everyone everyone jumps. Actually, there's often a lot of back and forth behind the, behind the door dialogue. And there will be policies that gets that gets notionally said by the central government, which does not get implemented properly um, by the regional government because it's not in their interest. As the saying in Chinese goes, you know, wherever there is, uh, well, wherever the top gives a policy, there's a regional counter policy. So it's, it's not as easy um, and smooth as I think it seems from the outside. And I think maybe one of the poor last points is kind of, you know, uh, it's, it, these regulators and organizations are also people. So apply the same kind of, um, you know, incompetence or mediocrity as you would with the typical Western governments. I think, you know, definitely that they move fast, but that, that's not to say they're infallible. Um, there's been plenty of times with Chinese regulators where they have also, you know, Made mistakes and they you know rectified it later on and uh, you know so it's it's I, I think it's easy to give them sometimes like uh, either not enough credit or too much credit, too much credit but maybe it's just to uh, it's it's helpful for everyone to view them as people. So here's a putting you under um, a bit of pressure here, but if you, if you had a new hundred dollars and you could invest it in the Chinese tech sector, uh, how, how would you look at that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I recently wrote an article or, around the Chinese five-year plan, um, which to just, just to, if you didn't know about it, is kind of Chinese kind of guidance, central guidance policy for the next five years, trying to do this every five years. And it's more, as I call it, a you know, state objective key results um, OKR system for China. And it highlights where the Chinese government and it wants this kind of sub governments, local governments to sort of think about in terms of big directions for China in the next five years. And I think the, the three themes that jumped out at me in looking at this document, one was you know, semiconductors, the other was renewable energies, I think, and specifically in terms of electric cars. And then the third one was uh, you know, cloud adoptions within industries. So 
if I if I have the money and, and a good time horizon of kind of five years at least, I would be looking deeply within those three sectors to sort of identify um, winners or at least, you know, be happy to take my bet on the entire sector because I think these are, these have always been rising sectors, but now that having gold and backings just makes them even more attractive. Okay, fantastic. So you recently sent out quite an interesting tweet, um, China innovate then regulate, the EU regulate and then not innovate. Just your, <laughs> your thoughts behind that? Yeah, I think it was um, kind of because I, you know, I lived a lot of my life in Europe and I worked briefly in the US as well and now I live in China. So just kind of seeing the attitude of um, the different places to regulation is very interesting. I think that's what inspired the tweet. And you know, as if you've been following me so far, it probably makes sense why I've said China will uh, innovate and then regulate because I think that's been the traditional cadence for regulators in China. I think in Europe, I've definitely seen this, this huge propensity to regulate before anything else. And when I compare the pace of innovation in Europe relative to US or China, it does feel like that, in, that regulation is not very helpful for um, new startups or um, innovators. So that's also kind of what inspired that observation on Europe. And I think the last piece on the tweet was me saying that the US innovates and then they don't regulate, which um, I also feel like is the case because at the, at the end of the day, US um, is a very capitalist society and anything to do with you know socialism or government intervention seems to just be terrible words in that culture. And I think they uh, really have lagged behind on some of the regulatory um, aspects of, of key industries in that um, in there. Okay, I'm going to invite Mark Gresty in now. Mark, feel free to post uh, to ask uh, Lillian some questions as well. And then Mark's going to follow on into um, NASPAS and, and we've got a NASPAS process reorganization where shareholders are going to make elections. Maybe before that, Mark, just an interesting one, a question that's just popped up. Um, the, obviously, there are big risks in the private education sector. The, the telehealth sector, do you see any risks there or is there anything there that's prejudicial or not good for the consumer? Um, at this point in time, it doesn't feel too much. I think, I, I mean, I, I go back to, and maybe this is just on my mind because I was writing about it on the five-year plan, where one of the key indicators for um, China is to have a certain number of um, physicians, uh, you know, per, per, um, a certain number per 10,000, and they put a target around that, which is unusual, and also a certain amount of um, elderly coverage. So to me, having telehealth could be playing well into both those themes. Um, so, uh, and, and we've definitely seen high adoptions of telehealth during COVID as well. So positive at this point in time. Um, yes. Mark, do you want to, um, any, any thoughts or, or things you want to get some clarity or thoughts on? Lillian, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Pete. Um, perhaps one just from my side, one of my concerns is whether perhaps you know, the, the weight of regulation that we're now seeing sort of imposed on the sector is likely to undermine their risk-taking ability, their sort of entrepreneurial flair, um, and maybe whether the sort of, can I call it the, the, the top-down model and its, its negative implications are perhaps being underestimated by the authorities in China. Um, you got any thoughts on that? So is, uh, just so to make sure I understand your question, so do you think that um, more regulations would lead to less innovative behaviors uh, or practices in Tencent? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it certainly feels to me as if, you know, to date, a lot of the success of, of these companies has been on the back of a relatively laissez-faire approach um, in, in a way. And, and that really feels to me like it's changing now. And I'm, I'm a little worried that, the implications of that um, to the regulators themselves as being underappreciated. Yes, I, I, I see what you mean. So I would also uh, say their success has come from 
a laissez-faire, but they were also operating in a very different environment. And what we've seen for the Chinese consumer internet is kind of in the last 20 years, because there was nothing right before um, Alibaba and Tencent came along. And growth was very easy. You know, the growth that was happening in the last 10 years didn't um, was almost effortless. They acquired customers because people were coming online. They had mobiles. They downloaded. Te- uh, they downloaded WeChat. They they um, you know bought things on Taobao. So, I think in the last few years, what you're actually seeing is really the Chinese market reaching more saturation, especially in terms of consumer tech. And what I've been observing in Chinese consumer tech is there is more bounded competition now more than ever because suddenly all the big players have realized this is the fine size of the pie once we continue to play in China. All the people that's going to come online has come online already. And so now we really need to think about where the next field of growth is coming from. And because they've had kind of 20 years of amazing success, um, it's actually quite difficult for them to actually envision a world where you know growth isn't as easy and also their behaviors are actually more moving less towards kind of value creation more i think towards extraction so i think there's also been behavior changes on the part of the platforms that's independent of the regulators and i think the regulators moves are a result of these and i'll just give a few concrete examples right to um to sort of highlight what i mean so one of the things we did see when the fight between meituan and Urolama, which are food delivery platforms when you know they were competing one of the ways in which they were competing was lowering delivery times for their product as, as you would envision but that often meant they were forcing their delivery drivers to take shorter and shorter time to get to a specific destination otherwise they were telling these delivery drivers that the pay would be docked so they're kind of in this kind of almost race to the bottom. Actually, delivery drivers got the brunt end of it, and there were you know waves of accidents on the part of delivery drivers. And then there was kind of more societal outcry over this, and then the regulators kind of then sort of came in and, and sort of say, hey, I, I, you know, you, you guys need to let the delivery drivers have more time uh, to do this. So we've kind of actually seen right now in the last few years more unhealthy competition, as I would put it, as the consumer internet has gotten more defined, and so. I understand from the outside, it seems like, you know, the, the regulators have sort of let them be uh, for a time that they were growing really well. But I think one of the reasons they're getting more concerned now is because that time is over and consumer internet is now in this like very difficult time. And so the easiest way for all of these players to extract value is potentially to go into predatory, slightly more predatory pre- practices. And I think that's then um, triggered a lot more online outrage, which then has, you know, triggered more regulator interest. So... That's my perspective. Guys, we, we're heading towards, sorry, Mark, is there any, any other things in your mind before we move into the next uh, phase? I'll probably park it there, Pete, and yeah, I know with time's moving on. So if there are other questions from, from um, the audience, that would be great. Sure, yeah, guys, sorry, we've, we've had heaps and heaps of questions. So the, um, We've, I've tried to distill them into the kind of the, the key issues and the things that Lillian's been prepared to talk about. So hopefully we've we've answered most of those. Um, so we, we asked Lillian to join us for about an hour. That's coming to an end. Um, I'd like to now just move, and Lillian, you, you're welcome to, if you have another appointment, um, you know, you're welcome to, thank you very much. Um, you're welcome to listen in to, Mark's just going to, we're just going to have a 10 minute session talking about how it flows through into NASPAS and process. Um, but thank you very much. And just to repeat, uh, you know, a resource we found incredibly useful is uh, Lillian's um, service called CN Characteristics. That's it's, correct. Uh, it's 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 a Substack newsletter called Chinese Characteristics. Yeah, just feel free to search for my name and uh, Chinese Characteristics. And, and if uh, anybody's hopefully. it's Lillian Li um, L I. Yes. So the, if anybody is battling to find her these days, it's easy on the internet. Give us pop us a mail and we'll help you with that. So. Um, thank you very much, Lillian, and feel free to listen no in. No worries. If you're still there. We'll, we might grab some more questions back to you. But I wanted to, um, so just to ask Mike, um, two key questions. You know, Mike and myself have looked at NASPAS for many, many years. Um, we're now sitting at a situation where NASPAS has been severely impacted by what's happened in the Chinese sector, and hence we thought it was a great idea to, to go through it today with, with an expert from Shanghai. Um, but Mark, if I can hand it over to you with two key questions, you know, kind of 
what's our view on NUSPAS now? And then moving into the next two weeks, um, people have to make an election between whether to keep their NUSPAS shares or swap some of them into process. So we'd love to love to get your perspectives and the view on that. Great, Pete. Thanks very much. So let's just deal with where we, we stand on NASPES now. I mean, obviously Lillian's input was hugely valuable and I must say I, I felt it was very reassuring to get that perspective on the ground as well as I think really sort of address, depending on what, you know how one sees uh, the comment she made, um, some of the concerns out there, which I think gives you a much more sort of pragmatic view aligned with what we we mentioned the other day, suggesting, you know, we think that this is a time to hold fast. Obviously, a huge amount of anxiety around all that's going on. It's distinctly unsettling to see, you know, a sell-off of the magnitude we've seen recently. But, you know, the way I like to think about NASPAS, it's almost, you know, when one's deciding whether you're a buyer or seller of it, there's almost a, a trifecta of areas you have to look at. So, first of all, you're looking at Tencent, you know, 81% of the net asset value, um, what's the valuation looking like? Obviously, after the sell-off, it's looking extremely attractive. Where are we sitting from a RAND dollar exchange rate? We're certainly in relatively strong territory. Um, and then what does the discount to net asset value look like at around 50%? It's been higher, but certainly it's at quite a high level. So when I look at all of those things, um, you know, absent concerns that we're about to see even more negative headwinds uh, from a Chinese perspective, you know, we would see this very much, you know, as, as probably a, a, a buying opportunity rather than a selling one. I know that most investors locally are, you know, full up with NASPAs. So, you know, in most cases, I would be thinking you just want to hold fast, um, look through to hopefully what we expect to be more stable times going forward. I think, as you mentioned, it certainly looks like from a 10 cent perspective, earnings wise, we're in a sort of year of, let's say, consolidation and a, and a reset. And that was very much the the message I took away from Lillian as well, um, that there is a bit of a reset going on, but there are brighter times ahead. So in short, um, hold fast if you're overweight NASPAs. Um, if you're one of the few that doesn't have much exposure to it, I, I really do think this is a very good opportunity um, to be looking at picking up some. Um, I think that probably addresses the issue of where we sit on NASPAs. If we can move then to the uh, upcoming decision that investors have to, to make as to whether to tender their shares into the offer that um, process is making. So just in short, uh, investors are looking at the opportunity to tender up to 45% of their shares in return for process uh, shares. Now, without going into too much detail about uh, the mechanics behind it, uh, what we've calculated is that if you do nothing, and this is a voluntary offer, of course, um, you will receive a pickup in the underlying net asset value behind your investment of about just over 6%. Um, there is an inducement to tender your shares because if you do that, uh, what we calculate is that you'll get a pickup in the underlying net asset value of um, closer to 10%. So there's a small sweetener there. Um, and the question is, should you do it? And I think you've got to look at each pot of investors. Um, what I would say is if tax is not an issue for you, uh, it really is a no-brainer, uh, and we would be tendering our shares uh, to benefit from that additional uh, pickup. I think there's another leg to this as well. Certainly, um, investors looking at what the, the world of NASPAs and process looks like after this deal, I think there's a little bit of anxiety beginning to creep in, even though NASPAs trades at a much bigger discount than process does, what is the sort of next story for NASPAs? Um, you know, I think one of the sadder aspects of this uh, deal is that, you know, the easy ideas around how we might unlock uh, value through narrowing the discount at a NASPAS level uh, really passes out of the picture for the for the time being. And there's a growing sense that, uh, you know, NASPAS will really be dragged along by whatever happens to process. And there's not really a clear story around NASPAS in isolation. Um, so a lot of investor interest and attention is really shifting to process, I think, where you know, you're getting the uplift in its uh, weighting in offshore indices. There's another 5 billion buyback, which should be you know, at the margin a bit supportive. So if you're not tax sensitive, A, because of the uh, sweetener you get in terms of the uplift of your underlying net asset value, and B, because the story around process perhaps is looking a little bit more interesting, I would certainly be tendering my shares uh, into the offer.
a lot more complicated for tax sensitive investors because you know one of the unfortunate things here is that it is going to trigger a tax event for you. Um, and I think that the answer there is actually quite a personal one. Um, if you're an investor holding uh, NASPAs, you have the right weight in it, uh, your intention is to hold it you know, forever, really. Uh, you know, here we're really talking about the law of compounding. And the law of compounding suggests uh, don't trigger a gain unless you have to. Um, and for those investors who honestly have no intention of selling their NASPAs shares, I would say the uplift you're getting is not really sufficient if you're sitting on a big untriggered capital gain to warrant making the switch. However, I think this is an interesting point for investors to reflect on, even if they're likely to trigger a capital gain. And, you know, when I step aside and say, you know, given how many ways one can play global tech now, um, which perhaps weren't there 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, if there's ever a time to trigger a capital gain, look afresh at your investment exposure to NASPERS and all the other ways that you can play tech. Uh, it's not the worst idea to consider perhaps triggering that gain and at least then have the freedom uh, to reassess your portfolio, look at perhaps at these RAND exchange rate levels, whether it might make sense to apply for um, your allowance to move investments offshore. Certainly the events over the last little while, you know, as much as we hope there's going to be a silver lining to this cloud, have given us a, a stark reminder as to why, even though, you know, we've really liked the sort of longer term story in China, there's a lot that can happen in a very short space of time, which you need to consider in terms of how much single stock exposure you want to NASPERS. So, you know, as I say, just to summarize, if your intention is to hold NASPERS forever, then don't trigger. However, I think this is obviously an opportunity where you're at least getting some incentive towards paying that CGT and then the ability to look at your uh, exposure to NASPERS afresh and other options for certain tax sensitive investors. I, I hope that makes sense. It's a bit of a complicated one, Pete. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And you know, feel free, guys, to talk to us from a personal perspective with, with your holdings uh, or, or through your financial advisor. Um, and then, you know, just we, we launched a global tech fund, it must be 18 to 24 months ago, uh, where the idea was to give people more diversified exposure to the tech sector. I think one of the things that we've learned through this whole process is that you don't want to be overexposed to any asset class, territory, particular share, et cetera, because the unexpected can happen to anything. So, we, you know, we really do emphasize diversification as a mantra in the business. And we do think it makes sense, as attractive as NASPAS might or might not be at any point in time, to have more diversified exposure through different, um, different tech players around the world. And there's obviously lots of different countries and lots of different sectors. So we've, we've had great success with that technology fund. It's been up there in the top two or three um, global equity funds quite consistently over the last 18 months. It's got some NASPAS and process in it. So what a lot of our clients have done and done through their IFAs is to convert their uh, NASPAS, NASPAS holding into a holding in the, in the global tech fund, um, which if done, which, you know, if, if, if done appropriately can, uh, can uh, you don't necessarily have to trigger a capital gains tax event. So that's certainly one of the options you should consider. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the global tech sector, NASPAS and Tencent is just one of those companies. So I guess that uh, we're five minutes over our time. We tried to keep it to an hour. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We hope it was of value. I say we were a little nervous beaming in from Shanghai. I think that the technology with Zoom and uh, Western devices and apps um, can, can sometimes be problematic. Uh, but I think that turned out well. I certainly learned a lot. And thank you for your participation. A recording of this will be sent out later today. So if people haven't caught all of it or, or want to have another listen, um, we'll, we'll kick it through. So thank you very much. Nice to see you all, or at least look at a screen and know that you're all behind the screen. I think we had seven or 800 people listening in today. So technology makes the opportunities amazing, but we're delighted and proud to be able to bring you uh, what we've just brought you. Thank you very much. Thank you.